Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest in our series of webinars with our legal partner, ANL Goodbody. The number of members joining us for our previous legal series webinars have been really encouraging. Feedback from the series has been really strong as well, with satisfaction scores of over 95%, along with really positive comments. For anyone who does want to catch up on the previous webinars in the series, you can do so on our website, charteredaccountants.ie forward slash Ulster. Today's webinar is an important look at the potential recessionary landscape ahead with Sam Corbett and Tanya Surgeon from our legal partner, ANL Goodbody. Sam Corbett is a partner within the firm and Tanya is an associate in the Belfast office. Together, they specialise in all aspects of business recovery and insolvency related matters and have extensive experience acting for local and national banks, financial institutions, funds, creditors and insolvency practitioners. Today's presentation will outline the difference between the current conditions and the recession of 2008-09, along with key things that both accountancy practices and those accountants working in business should be aware of from a legal standpoint. Please feel free to put the questions to Sam and Tanya into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. The Q&A is open now, so feel free to type them in. But do please keep your questions general. Our presenters cannot answer specific legal questions during the webinar, but we will give you their contact details should you wish to contact contact them directly with more detail. So we have a lot to get through, so let's kick off. I'd now like to welcome Sam and Tanya. Thank you, Maeve, for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before we be begin, I think it would also be useful for us to briefly introduce ourselves. As you can see from this opening slide, my name is Sam Corbett, and I'm the partner heading up the restructuring and solvency team in Belfast. And I'm joined today by one of three associates in my team, Tanya Surgeon. Between the two of us and right across our team, we have extensive experience of the restructuring and solvency market in Northern Ireland, having acted and been involved in some of the most notable, complex and high value restructuring and solvency mandates that we've seen across the island of Ireland over the last number of years. And with that in mind, the Ulster Society has asked us to speak today in this session about the current recessionary landscape and to explore how it compares to what we experienced in 2008, 2009, and even how those market conditions compare and differ to what we were beginning to see signs of pre-pandemic. I'm sure everyone will appreciate that what we've experienced over the last number of months, in fact, over the last couple of years, has been an uncertain climate. And some commentators say that there are many parallels to the period that preceded the last major recession in 2008, 2009. There are perhaps similarities around market conditions. But as we'll touch upon over the next 30 or 40 minutes, that doesn't mean that any recession will be the same as the last time. And there, there are, in our view, some quite key differences to the market conditions, which might make this recession really quite different to the last. So that's a bit of a snapshot as to what we want to explore in this session. But even though we're lawyers, we don't really intend to do that by focusing in on insolvency law or legislation or looking at insolvency processes or what director duties might be but rather we thought it would be more useful for everyone if we focused in on the current market conditions and looked at the question posed in this slide. And that is whether there is in fact a perfect storm brewing, but we'll do this then against the backdrop of our experience of the last recession, which allows us to look at how the recessionary landscape might be very different and to make some predictions and do that hard task at the end. Before we dive in to look at the current market conditions, it's worthwhile circling back to April 2020. And I know that many of you will not want to do that. None of us want to go back to that period, period of lockdowns, health concerns and homeschooling. But it is important to do so because the first question to consider, in, to consider when looking at the current recessionary landscape is to revisit why what everyone in the restructuring and solvency sphere thought would happen in 2020 when the pandemic ended just didn't actually materialize. As I've termed it in the slide here, the expected recession. Why didn't that happen? That's what many commentators, lawyers, IEPs were talking about through 2020 onwards. And the answer to that is quite simple, and it can be broken down into three key points. One, extra liquidity. From 2020 onwards, you'll all have experienced that the, of how much liquidity there was in the market. It came from a number of sources and schemes. You can see some examples in the slide. C bills and B bills, through the furlough payments in JRS, through cash reserves that businesses somehow managed to, to build up, and through fat deferrals. 
So there's so much liquidity within the market that then when that's coupled with the second factor of low interest rates, it means that the cost of borrowing just allowed more money to then come into the market. And this rather perversely, it might seem, encouraged growth and investment in some sectors, despite there being some very harsh conditions. And the third factor, and probably one of the most important factors for restructuring and insolvency professionals, was there was little to no enforcement action in this period. Almost overnight in 2020, we saw the government effectively turn off the switch on creditor winding up petitions, statutory demands, and pretty much any enforcement action. Because what was introduced there prevented creditors bringing winding up petitions or statutory demands, which are often the catalyst to many restructuring and, and other insolvency procedures, whether that be a company voluntary arrangement or an administration. And this was supported for 18 months, nearly going on two years, by the attitude taken by the official receiver and the court service in Northern Ireland. Added to that, there was also a tendency within lenders and banks to be passive anyway in this period. There was just a huge focus across the financial services sector and society as a whole in this period to providing support. So I think you can see from this slide why the expected recession and what we thought within the restructuring and solvency market, and what we all talked about in April 2020 onwards, never actually happened or maybe just hasn't happened yet. So where are we now? So fast forward two years into 2022. When looking at the recessionary landscape, I'd like to make four overall points here in order to set the scene before we begin to drill down into the threats in our market and what the macro and micro challenges are. So the first point I'd make, you can see it appearing in the slide already, is there's a lot of debt in the system. But unlike 2008 and 2009, a fair proportion of that debt comprises bounce back loans and C bills. And the difference there is that unlike the debt that we saw flowing into the system in 2008, 2009, this debt comes with a government guarantee to an extent. And it therefore remains to be seen what is gonna happen with that debt. Could it be written off to an extent? Will we see it extended? Will we see banks operate and extend and pretend policy? Who knows? But what we do know is there's a lot of debt left in the system. And therefore to compensate for that, what we are beginning to see, and we've seen it over the last number of months, is the introduction of fiscal and monetary policies to curb behaviors. behaviors. With fiscal policy, we've seen national insurance contributions increase. We've also seen taxation policy change generally. And with monetary policy, only last Thursday, the Bank of England's increased interest rates again. And that's all designed to compensate for what we're seeing in order to try behaviors, in order to try to curb behaviors. But there are a couple of buts here in setting the scene. The first but is that despite all of what we're actually experiencing, there is still consumer demand. And what we are seeing at the moment appears to be driven by consumer behavior. And so consumer behavior to us seems to be a bit like a live in the moment culture. But over the last weeks and months, it's moved into behavior on steroids perhaps because people have lived throughout an unprecedented pandemic. And that may mean that many of you are thinking, well, that tends away from a recessionary climate. But our view is the consumer behaviors we're, we are experiencing in the market at the moment are simply unsustainable. They, they, they fly in the face of logic. They seem to defy economic theory. I'm gonna pass over to Tanya shortly. She'll be able to explore the reasons for this and why it is when we look at market conditions at a macro and micro level. The fourth point I want to make, and the other but, when we look to scene setting in 2022, is to look at corporate transactional activity. Corporate transactional activity and what we're experiencing, and I'm sure what many of you are experiencing, is at an all-time high. We see that within our own clients, and we see that within our own business. We've never been busier in that sphere. But some of the multiples that you see within the market or you hear that are being paid for businesses do seem to be extraordinarily high. And again, you might be thinking, well, consumer behaviors and the transactional market would suggest against a recessionary landscape. But I think you have to go back and look at what is the reason why corporate transactional activity is so buoyant at the moment? And the answer to that, we think, lies within private equity. I think the cash piles have grown up within private equity and it needs to be deployed. And if you put your, your, yourself in the shoes of private equity, 
if they're not deploying their cash, well then they're clearly losing money for their investors at a rate now of say 5% plus given the rate of inflation. So that may be one of the reasons which tends towards that corporate transactional activity. But the reason I fast forwarded from 2020 to 2022 and put these four scene setting points up in the slide is to show you how clearly I think we can see that the scene is different in 2022 and the landscape is totally different to the landscape that there was in 2008 and 2009 when we we're facing into the last major recession. Moving on to the threats, the threats within our local market are also different. And I'll give you an example of this from this slide. Prior to the pandemic, many of our clients were asking us to give them some of our observations, whether it was in seminars and presentations about the threats we saw in the market. And this was maybe in 2019 or so. And this infographic tells a story as to how those threats have changed. Because in late 2018, maybe into 2019, all we would have been showing you would be the left-hand side of this infographic. There were, as we saw it, two major threats within the local market. The first was Brexit, still a threat. And the second was local political instability. If anything, the last week is shown, again, it's still a threat. But at that time in 2019, there were only dual threats in the market. But those dual threats are still there. But now, as you move over to the right-hand side of the infographic, there are at least two more threats locally. I know there are many more, and we'll try and drill into some of them in a minute. But you add in the Brexit and local in political instability, a pandemic, and now a cost of living crisis. So there are four threats, or four major threats, and many more in the market. And the one point I would make there, in terms of the difference to the market conditions we saw pre-pandemic, or even the difference to the market conditions that we saw in 2008 and 2009, is that with these four threats at a local level coalescing together, I don't think any of us have ever seen as many pressure points within the local market come together and come at us and come at local businesses as quickly before. And as I mentioned, there are only four that we pick out at a local level. There are many more at macro and micro level. And I do think that before we go on to examine how we think and predict what this recessionary landscape might look like, it's important to drill down in and look at those market pressures and how they are playing out within Northern Ireland and how they differ from 2008 and 2009. And for that, I'm going to hand over to Tanya now to explore that in a bit further detail. So as Sam's touched upon at a very high level, there are many pressures in the market at present and more so than there were pre-pandemic when the dual factors of Brexit and political instability were already tending towards a potential recession here. But we've identified six key threats at a macro level. There are more, I'm sure, but we just don't have the time or indeed the space on this slide to consider everything that's hitting at present. Some might say it's coming from all angles. The key message, though, is that the embryonic recovery that we were beginning to see post-pandemic and the recovery that we had all hoped for has pretty much been stopped in its tracks by a multiplicity of factors. So beginning in the top left, political uncertainty and uncertainty over the NI protocol, you don't need me to tell you how much of an issue that is here at present. The future of the protocol and the future of our local assembly remains a big issue for many industries and sectors here. And unfortunately, it's unclear exactly how negotiations will play out on either of those things. And that brings us back to that word again, uncertainty. And uncertainty over the implementation of the protocol is extremely unhelpful, particularly as it seems that it might endure for some time yet. Moving on then, another market pressure that we didn't have before now is a war. The Russian invasion of Ukraine, quite apart from the tragic humanitarian consequences, is leading to volatile oil and gas markets, shortages in fertilizer, and shortages in grains and oils. The sanctions imposed on Russia and those close to Putin are also having an impact in the market. Now, as you can see, moving on, the war has also exacerbated already rising energy costs. We can all see this in our wallets. And that in turn feeds into the cost of living crisis that we're seeing domestically, which in reality is playing out across the globe. 
we're hearing from businesses who are seeing enormous increases on their energy bills. We have some reports um, of businesses seeing three times what they saw six months ago in their bills. Another macro pressure then is supply chain disruption. So initially we saw supply chains interrupted as a direct result of COVID lockdowns. And that was recently exacerbated by further lockdowns implemented in China. High sickness rates among staff and supply reduction from Ukraine and Russia are also contributing here. And this is all in a landscape of heightened demand as Sam mentioned, with consumers perhaps seeking to make the most of post lockdown life. Fiscal support has now, largely speaking, been withdrawn from businesses, and what's left is much less accommodating for those businesses. As Sam mentioned, the Bank of England has raised interest rates last week, and those now sit at a 13-year high. But crucially, there's still no obvious stimulus to improve the conditions that we're experiencing right now. And then finally, the pandemic is still a major issue. On the one front, the Treasury is trying to pay for the relief that it introduced during the pandemic, but the investment required for genuine reform of the NHS and our social care systems will be enormous, and commentary seems to suggest that it will be difficult to fund this without some sort of tax rise, which we're beginning to see play out. So circling back to the recession that um, commenced in 08 09, it's self-evident that there are many more market pressures than we've ever seen before fusing together all at once, which makes this recessionary landscape, re landscape really quite different. It points to there potentially being a much sharper and quicker recession than there was before. So that was the macro picture. And I think it would be useful now to bring this into a local context um, from businesses and consumers perspective to show how so many of those factors that we've mentioned are merging together all at the same time, creating what we've termed the perfect storm. And on this slide, I'm going to briefly touch on five key items that we're all seeing go up in price at the same time and very sharply. So let's start with the obvious fuel. The crude oil price is up and was already rising before the war in Ukraine. The Russian invasion has made the supply chain issue all the more acute. And since February, the average price of diesel in the UK has driven, um, has risen by 18% with unlead unleaded going up by 11%. So for consumers, this has an obvious impact. And for low margin businesses locally, that kind of price raise is, is just unsustainable. I think then closely linked to that is energy prices. We've mentioned that already again, driven up by post-lockdown demand. So whilst the UK gets a very small percentage of its gas from Russia, it's still impacted by volatile global markets and prices. And overheads for many of our local businesses are rising at a pace that their cash reserves and even the most conservative business planning can't cope with. So many businesses, as I've said, are talking about a ratio of three to one on their energy costs, and that doesn't look like it's abating anytime soon. Moving on then, raw materials, the rising cost of these materials, whether it be hardwoods, fabrics, steel, coupled with the supply chain disruption that I've mentioned are contributing to these price rises. That's having a substantial impact on the construction and manufacturing sectors in Northern Ireland, but it's also a bit wider and deeper than that. Coupled with high demand post pandemic, logistics issues, supply chain issues, all of that has pushed up the shipping costs and thereby pushing up prices for consumers and businesses even further. Another interesting one, oils and cooking ingredients. Again, we think that will hit the hospitality sector in Northern Ireland, particularly after a really rough couple of years coming out of the pandemic. So prices in that area have increased by 7.2% in March alone, nearly a quarter more expensive than the same time last year. And prices of alternatives are also rising in light of increased demand. Finally, then, food products. We can all see these prices going up in our weekly shop, and that's likely to also have an impact on our retail, agri and hospitality sectors in Northern Ireland in particular. So those are some of the market conditions at both a macro and micro level. And as we've said, they differ in many ways from 0809. A couple of our observations here are as follows. One, most of these pressures are completely sector agnostic and therefore they're bound to profoundly impact on all businesses. And then two, 
for some sectors, it is literally coming from all angles. The perfect storm that we've mentioned a couple of times. There's relentless pressure with little to no let up. And that brings with it, that brings with it headwinds that are blowing strongly towards a recessionary landscape. So despite factors that tend to show against a recession, such as a buoyant labor market, consumer behavior, high levels of transactional activity, as Sam spoke about, this all seems to be unsustainable to us, particularly where there's no obvious stimulus to address the issues. Whilst raising interest rates is bound to have some impact, it's unlikely to completely solve what is ultimately a supply and demand issue driving the cost of living crisis. So the issue for us is not so much if a recession takes place, but when, and the uncertainty is around timing, could be Q4, and severity. So let's now look at how we see the recessionary landscape playing out. Having looked at the market conditions and why we thought what would happen in 2020 ultimately didn't materialize, let's bring it back to present day and look at where we are now here in May 2022 and what we predict for the recessionary landscape in front of us. I'm going to take a look at some recent statistics and what's being said in the press around the current market. And then it's that time when Sam's going to have a look into the crystal ball to try and predict when we're going to see some movement in the restructuring turnaround sphere and what we're likely to encounter along the way. We've done this a number of times since the beginning of the pandemic, but given um, the government interventions introduced since 2022, we've almost given up trying to predict the precise timing at this stage. But we are pretty certain that there will be a downward trend. And as I said, the uncertainty is the precise timing and the severity of that downturn. Let's begin by looking at some recent statistics published by the Insolvency Service in respect of corporate insolvencies for February this year. Um, these were uh, given out in April, uh, no updated figures yet um, beyond Q1. So. As you can see from the stats, as at February this year, there's an increase in appointments from the same time last year, with a combined total of 18 CVLs, admins and compulsory liquidations. That's not that surprising, though, given that at the same time last year reflected a period of really, really strict, harsh COVID lockdown when the government restrictions on enforcement were very firmly in place. It's a lot more useful, therefore, to compare it to the pre-pandemic period um, and what you see when we do that, despite the rise on 2021's numbers, is that appointments are still a third lower than pre-pandemic levels for the same period in 2020. So some might say that that tends to suggest against this recessionary landscape that we keep talking about, but don't be fooled by the stats. What the stats do is they demonstrate actually that the efficacy of some of the protective measures implemented by the government during the pandemic lockdowns. The recession that we all expected to see back in 2020 just didn't materialize then because of those um, measures put in place. And in actual fact, they probably had their desired effect. The stats, therefore, aren't that useful for last year, but it is quite clear to us that the level of insolvencies has been artificially low for over two years now, but that's for obvious reasons. And we think that those insolvencies are unfortunately likely to increase in the months to come. So, as I said, don't be fooled by the statistics and let's look at the reality of the market that we're now living in. You only need to look at a snapshot of the recent news headlines, which are captured somewhat on the slide here, and they all talk about the risk of a recession in Europe, the US and China, all rising day by day. And that was, in fact, the exact headline that appeared in The Guardian on the 28th of April 2022. So, we can also speak to our own experience as one of the largest and busiest um, restructuring and insolvency teams in Northern Ireland. And we're already beginning to see the first signs of a recession coming from many different angles. So whether that be from corporate Northern Ireland, from London law firm contacts, you've got to remember that in London, that market is just a little step ahead of where we tend to be locally. And then indeed from our private equity contacts to their sophistication always sees them planning quite early and, and being up the, the curve ahead of others. So as has probably become quite clear to you over the course of the last few slides, the way we see this recessionary landscape is it is not if, but when a recession occurs. 
And that suppose that's the easy thing to say. But the question marks we have are around when, a timing. Tanya mentioned there maybe Q4, others say maybe Q1 2023 and severity. But the more interesting thing we think is to look, well, how might that recessionary landscape play out? What are our predictions? What might we see? And how might that differ to what we saw the last time when there was a last major recession in 2008 and 2009? And in that slide, that is what we want to explore and to see what we think we might see in this recession uh, and how that might be different to the landscape that played out in 08 09. So there's six points, six areas uh, I want to discuss here. First of all, bank and lender enforcements. What do we predict here? Look, I suspect there will be a degree of bank-driven enforcement work, just like there was in the last recession. But I fully expect it to be different. And I, I do expect it to be different to 2009 for a number of reasons. One, there just isn't the property issues for 2008, 2009. Two, it's likely to be more focused within SMEs. And therefore, you're not going to see the bulk of fixed charge receiverships that we saw. But what I foresee, and you can already see it within banks and lenders, is that they'll become less concerned with proactive enforcement and more collaborative restructuring will take place between banks and customers. The market will allow that, but that's the attitude I think you'll see from banks and lenders. And that is in contrast, markedly, to what we saw in 2008, 2009. Um, so generally, I think, not just with banks and lenders, but with any creditors, I think they're gonna have to think about a different approach. The approach of just looking at formal insolvency procedures and looking at enforcement is gone. You have to look for a recovery and restructuring and what, what collaborative restructurings can take place within corporates. And we do have the tools to do that now, which we'll come on to. Second prediction, trading administrations. So look, the signs are that we are seeing and then some F SMEs are that they're in reasonably good health. Um, some are actually doing very well, very well indeed, having delivered efficiencies during the pandemic. However, there is a bit of a flip side, side to that coin. And there is another view that the pandemic was such a great catalyst to force businesses to find cost efficiencies that when they face into a, a difficult period, then unlike the situ a normal situation as before, they might just not be able to cut this and cut that, take more out of the cost line here. And where the demand side falls, which I suspect will, as I mentioned earlier on, whether that's because of inflation, rate rises, energy rises, there's going to be nowhere to go for some of these SMEs, unfortunately. So what we anticipate here and predict is that there might be a wave of restructuring required. And to some extent, that will require the use of administration and that different approach I mentioned earlier. And we may, may there more see more trading administrations than we did during the last recession where SMEs, which have good underlying businesses, they may be insolvent, but ultimately they may be viable um, if they're put into the protection of insolvency process. So that's one other prediction that we have for this recessionary landscape. And that does differ to 2008, 2009. Yes, undoubtedly back then and throughout that recession, there were trading jobs, but there weren't that many. And I do think that there could be a lot more, particularly within the SME sector this time around. Third prediction. Accelerated m and that is one thing we do foresee. I, I, I do think we're likely to see a lot more accelerated m and processes and restructurings as opposed to formal pre-packed transactions. There were a lot of pre-packed transactions the last time, but I think this time around, bank deposit levels perhaps suggest that there's sufficient cash to facilitate the buyer investment side of these transactions. And as I mentioned earlier, there's cash piles within private equity. And that is one of the key differences, one of the underlying key differences between now and 2008 and 2009, and that's liquidity. The, li the liquidity in the market is a massive difference because it provides for restructuring and solvency professionals so much more scope and opportunity to explore restructuring and recovery. Sometimes people focus upon the insolvency, the word insolvency within the solvency practitioner, or within restructuring and solvency team. But the core and key objective is always to deliver restructuring and recovery. And liquidity is key to that. And what we predict and foresee, hopefully, is that options that just weren't on the table 
in 2008, 2009, are now on the table to avoid terminal insolvency processes and allow restructuring and insolvency, insolvency um, practitioners to allow recovery. Um, this could be the availability of anything. We're already seeing it, whether it's loans being coming in from alternative providers, whether it's equity stakes being taken, whether it's the ability to do sale and lease back transactions, debt for equity swaps. There's now liquidity locally within the market that there just wasn't there in 08 or 09. So moving on, private equity. What do we predict there? Like I touched upon private equity um, briefly when, when, when discussing accelerated m as and, and uh, earlier on. Um, I make two points here. I've got a question mark beside private equity, you'll note. I do anticipate on the one hand, there will be a wave of restructuring because there is highly geared private equity debt still out there. And that's just going to need to be restructured. There's just no way about it. It'll have to happen. But the other point I make about private equity is, I, I, I'm going to talk about private equity in this guy's loan sales purchasers, loan funds. And I just don't expect them, in my view, to play as big a role as they, they, they did in the last recession and this recession. I just don't see the wide scale loan sales. I just don't see a, a massive role necessarily for them, principally because I think we may have enough liquidity within local buyers and local funders and banks in Northern Ireland and the UK that maybe private equity isn't needed. Fifth, voluntary arrangements. Um, we, 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 I think it was Tanya mentioned earlier on that much of what we're seeing at the moment is sector agnostic. But there are some suggestions that retail is going to be hit hard again. I don't think that comes as any surprise to anyone. But what might be slightly surprising is that even though we've already had that wave of retail company voluntary arrangements and restructurings, right-sizing stores, um, we're hearing on some of our contacts in the London market and already seeing it, that those cuts weren't hard enough and they didn't go deep enough and that there may be another spate of retail CVAs. So that might be another trend and prediction. Um, and it might be something that is actually similar to what we experienced the last time around. The other reason I've put voluntary arrangements up in the slide is that I do feel that they may be more prevalent. Uh, and that's because there is a, a, a view, albeit there is a, a strong contrary view against it, that HMRC may be a bit more passive now than they were before. And the result of that may potentially be that you might have, as an insolvency practitioner, might have more of a chance of getting uh, a voluntary arrangement through. And finally, liquidations, bankruptcies. What we predict here is we think undoubtedly we're going to see an uptick in liquidations and an increase in bankruptcies. And this just isn't because of the back backlog in the court system or because of the pandemic masking issues within zombie companies. It's because of all the factors and market pressures just seem to lead to that obvious conclusion. And unfortunately, that may mean that those on lower income salaries become worse off or those companies at the, the, the bottom end of the scale are more adversely affected. And this could then be seen to have an impact in the personal insolvency sphere. So there are some of our predictions or ideas of what we think we might see when we emerge into this recessionary landscape. I think it's pretty obvious that it's different to 2008, 2009. And one of the key differences is the underlying thread of liquidity in the market. And I really do think that is a major contrast to 2008, 2009. And back then, there was no liquidity. I, I, when the recession hit, it was a long, deep recession from 2009. There was no liquidity in the market, so that then meant that there was no buyers. Um, that then had the consequent effect of two things. Private equity came in and stepped in, and two, the recession dragged out for longer than anyone wanted it to. And I think the, the difference and potentially and actually the advantage this time around is that there is liquidity. And more importantly, that there's that liquidity housed within local buyers and funders. So the effect of that might be that we don't see private equity, as I mentioned, but more importantly, that we might see a shorter, sharper, quicker recession, which surely is better than the long drawn out recession that we experienced from 2009 onwards. So 
just to draw this all together. So see, we're approaching 35 minutes or so, and to try and shape out the, the perfect storm that has emerged. Let's go back to the start of the presentation. We mentioned in 2020 why the expected recession that we termed it didn't happen. And that was because there was a plaster placed around many things. But that sticky plaster at the start of this year or early last year was gradually being peeled back. There was no J more JRS. There were no more fat deferrals, no more C bills, B bills, and creditor enforcement action largely back in the table. Yes, it's not 100% back there, but it's a lot better from a creditor's perspective than it was in April 2020. And that's the emerging picture that local businesses and SMEs had in Northern Ireland at the start of this year. Sticky plaster scratchy being peeled back. We're hopefully having the embryonic signs of recovery. And if that wasn't sort of hard enough for them to deal with, any signs of that recovery for a business were almost immediately impacted upon by those micro and macro factors that Tanya talked about. And pretty much you can see from the slides earlier on in the macro level and the micro level, the pressure on consumers and businesses is coming from all angles. Absolutely no let up in it. So having come through a, the, the pandemic and having thought that it stabilized, the pressure is then coming on from all angles. And this, in our, in our view, has to have an impact on consumer confidence and spending power. You know, real wages are clearly falling. And that all has to, and that all, all the factors point to the live in the moment culture coming home to roost. And I think that the danger is that there could just be a real sharp human behavioral switch off. And if that happened, that could come on pretty quickly. And if it came on pretty quickly, then that's going to have an immediate and direct impact on business. And when that, impa when that impact ha happens, where there's no obvious stimulus to boost recovery, then drawing it all together, that's why we say that it's a recessionary landscape. And that's why we say it's a question of when, not if, but as will be apparent from the, the, from the previous slide, it'll be different from 2008 and 2009. And a driving factor for that difference is liquidity within the market. And the one question that we, that we have been considering and the sort of silver lining to this cloud is whether this could see the emergence of a dual market. And what I mean by that is you do have very busy corporate transaction activity. It's showing, it's showing no abating over the last 18 months. It's a busy market. Multi, the multiples being paid for businesses are self-evident there. But given what we're seeing within the restructuring insolvency sphere, it's quite clear to us that there has to be a downward trend there. And you can have a very busy restructuring insolvency activity. And that's the dual market they talk about. You have busy corporate activity, busy restructuring insolvency activity. It remains to be seen, but you, know, you do often hear that those who've had it bad seem to have had it very bad. And those that seem good have it very good. So it doesn't seem to us to be beyond the realms of possibility that there could be a bit of a dual market emerging within any recessionary landscape that we see. I said that we try and stick to 35, 40 minutes, and I, I, I hope we, we, we've done that to allow a bit of time for Q&A. Um, but, but for anyone interested in what we've spoken about over the last 35, 40 minutes. Our team do produce a quarterly update. And hopefully, if the technology is allowed, you'll see a one pager similar to, to, to what we produce on, on the webinar slides. And what we have tried to do here within this quarterly update is to, to distill it to what we call in our team Twitter mode, giving you a short and snappy couple of sentences and key points arising from the quarter. Not everyone has the time to, to spend at it. Uh, on webinars or to spend time reading articles. Our clients are telling us that this is how they want to receive their information and we agree with them. So everyone just wants to look at something in 30 seconds and, 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 we, and we think this quarterly update delivers it, whether you want to catch up in local cases or whether you want to catch up on what's happening in distressed M&A activity. So I, I, look, I just thought I'd throw that up for anyone who might be interested uh, in it, um, our contact details are available within the slides and, and the Ulster Society, I think we'll, we'll share the slides afterwards. So by all means, 
anyone who, who wants to be included in the circular list can drop us a, an email and we'd be more than happy to, to, to add uh, you to the circular list and you can see how and if any of my crystal ball gazing and, and predictions actually come true. I think we do the, the, then have a bit of time, maybe 10 minutes or so, maybe for Q&A. Um, so I, I can stop sharing my screen now and, and pass back to you. But before I do so, I just wanted to thank everyone for your time. And, and I ho we, we hope you find that to be both useful and informative. That's great. Thank you so much, Sam and Tanya, for, for all those insights. Um, we we'll start to get a few questions through here, but I'll maybe just kick things off with one. Um, you mentioned HMRC and that you thought they would be more passive this time than they were in the last recession. Can you give us a bit more detail around that and a bit more about what type of stance you think HMRC will take um, yeah. in any recession that there might be? <laughs> yeah, I think it was uh, me who mentioned HMRC. Um, and I, I did that in the context of talking about the recessionary landscape and our predictions. Um, and what I said there was I didn't think HMRC would be the, the threat that we're used to. Now, many, I think, will disagree with that. But you know, often in the last recession, we were advising clients to be aware of HMRC. Um, but I'm just not so sure that they'll, they'll be the force that they were uh, pre-pandemic. And the reason being is that I think for a while, at least, they're bound to be more passive. Because you've got to remember that all the support that government's ejected into the system is, is something that they're unlikely to want to see undone by an aggressive response by HMRC. But... That said, as I said, uh, when it was in, in the context of the presentation, people will say there's a bit of a flip side to that. Uh, and some might say that HMRC will be more aggressive now, or at least as aggressive as they were before, for two reasons. One, you know, unlike banks or um, other creditors, they're less worried about reputation. So that, that they might be more aggressive there. And then two, remember from December 2020, they now find themselves higher up the insolvency waterfall. So I do think that there is a school of thought that, that, that is credible enough that HMRC, given their enhanced position in insolvency, might say, look, you know, we'll, we'll be as aggressive as we were before. But I just find it hard to get away from the fact that we're coming off two years of government support and that they might just be encouraged to be a bit more passive than they were before. Um, but look, it's hard to, to, to gauge in, in any of these predictions, but th that's the way I see it. It's all down to the support they put in, isn't it? Yeah, a very um, popular question actually coming in here, and they're all kind of along the same lines, is are there any sectors that you think are more fragile than others? And then someone's just noted that you mentioned retail will be hit hard, but they're also yeah. um, like to know your views on the potential impact of the construction sector. So kind of all around that kind of what sectors to look out for. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's hard when you look at the, the, the sectors. I think largely to us, this recessionary landscape appears to be pretty sector agnostic. But when looking at any of the businesses in the sectors, there are to my mind two things you need to look out for. And it'll apply in construction as it will in retail. And the sort of two metrics I think you need to look for are one, input prices, so which are driven by cost inflation and supply chain troubles you need to keep an eye on sectors and uh, with input prices there and uh, that are affected there and two and this maybe sounds a bit obvious but businesses that consume a lot of energy um and to me they're the metrics you need to come out to when you need to, to, to watch out for when looking in terms of what sectors it might it might affect i i, I do feel that it's just so wide and varied those that i've spoken to over the the, the course of the last three or four months it's just from construction to food to retail, um, it, it, it's wide and varied. Me, if it, it 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 just seems to be, as Tanya mentioned, coming at so many from so many angles. Um, it it, it just doesn't d discriminate by sector. Mm -hmm. well, energy is going to be a big big hit, isn't it? Um, the government introduced new insolvency procedures during 2020. How much use of those procedures have you seen? I can maybe take that one. Mm -hmm. Like I think there's a shorter answer and a long answer. So I'll start with the, the short answer, which is not at all. And um, I suppose the long answer to that then is in many ways, it's not surprising given all the factors that Sam and I have mentioned. So JRS, VAP deferral, B bill, C bills, and prevention on enforcement. And those have all served as really effective measures against a wave of insolvencies. So the new measures, the restructuring plan, the moratorium haven't 
really be needed. Um, the restructuring plan we think may have a place, but as for the standalone moratorium, um, that's fallen away in Northern Ireland due to the lack of executives. So new regulations weren't put in place by the executive before um, fell apart uh, in place to uh, support the continued use beyond 31st of March 2022. Um, so that's now off the table. Um, we think the restructuring plan, as I said, may have a place. But if you look what's happening in England, um, they tend to be slightly further up the curve than we are. There have only been nine restructuring plan cases implemented since um, the beginning um, of their kind of coming on the scene in 2020. So on the one hand, that figure could be artificially low, like some of the stats that I spoke about earlier, um, reflecting a lack of cases um, on which to implement them. Or on the other hand, it could be reflective of many practitioners' views and assessment that this is a sort of blockbuster style um, tool that'll be used and reserved for very, very large insolvencies. And if you look at some of the, the names involved in those cases, that's quite reflective of, of that assessment. Okay, great. Um, do you have any practical tips for companies encountering market pressures? Or are there any early warning signs to watch out for? Yeah, I think I think there are lots of early warning signs to, to, to consider, and we're often out speaking to lenders and, and banks about those, but I guess this was the theme within the webinar, it's a little bit different this time around. So um, whilst we think that businesses and their professional advisors and their FDs probably will need to act a lot more quickly this time, um, and as we mentioned, the, the, the potential that any recessionary market that does arise is that it could be much shorter and shorter, sharper than, than 08, 09. Um, and I think the normal signs are still, of course, very relevant. So a lack of communication, dissonance amongst um, a board, um, against board members and increasing debtor days, things like that are absolutely um, still relevant. But I think that um, as Sam mentioned, spikes in prices and sort of shocks in the market um, are going to necessitate a really speedy response. And I think companies that will come out of this well are those that have um, are able to implement a sort of predetermined action plan um, with those that seek sort of early input from specialist advisors, probably well placed to, to, to deal with those um, issues and risks that are arising as opposed to those that that bury the head in the sand. So um, I think that's something that insolvency sort of professionals often mention. And I think um, a quick response will be vital. Mm -hmm. Maybe on that, I think the early warning signs is going to be very different to what it was before. Mm -hmm. And you touched upon that in terms of time. We used to have a, a graph that we'd show in terms of what, what, what a typical recovery would look like or route to insolvency or up to recovery and we talk about underperformance uh, we then talk about um, loss of key contract crisis etc but I think that this time around it, it, it tends to be or has the potential to be a bit atypical a where when you look at consumer demand uh, there could just be a short sharp drop in, in human behavior and that therefore could come on really quickly for businesses so for advisors you, you might not get the typical early signs of watching dead or days change or loss of a contract or you know, staff issues or statutory demand. Um, and so the early warning signs might be a bit different. And it goes back to the point I was talking around in, in, in the sectors. It might be a, you know, a, a spike in input costs or um, supply chain impact where simply where there's simply just no product input. Um, they're just, we're, we're, and that means speed this time more than anything is probably key. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, very few more questions coming in here, but lastly, I just want to actually end on one here. Um, there was a brief mention at the end um, of a dual market. Can you give us a little bit more detail on that? Yeah, I, I mentioned that just in, mm -hmm. in, in closing. Um, and I didn't put it in the prediction side because you know, I'm not completely convinced that it'll be the case. Uh, uh, but I think that you know, it does seem strange to be sitting here talking about a recessionary landscape when corporate transaction activities at an all-time high. I'm sure uh, anyone, CF advisors, is seeing that. I mean, they're seeing such multiples they're getting for businesses. But to me, at the same time, you can't get away from the fact that there's red warning signals going off everywhere. Um, and the fact that, the, that there's a danger that the, this could just go sharply and so, suddenly, and, and, and some economists have, have talked about it, who's mentioned that to the last question, there could just be this automatic, quick human behavioral switch off. Um, so, I, 
I, I think, and we've talk, talked about it in our team, that there's a possibility that the, the recession that comes is something that when it happens, it happens very quickly and sharply, but it isn't as deep and drawn out as it was in, in 08, 09. And one of the reasons for that is the, the underlying point I mentioned around liquidity. Um, but the other reason is corporate transactional activity. And I don't think that shows any sign of abating. And when you think of it, often you think of it's a bit of a seesaw, structuring and solvency work will go up and the corporate transactional M&A activity will go down or, or vice versa. But this time, I think that you might have both of them sitting at the same level. That's the sort of dual market uh, uh, that I mentioned. Um, is you, you might not see the abatement there, but it still means that the restructuring solvency um, mandates and restructurings may be, be there as well. And I'm sure you know, uh, it's like a silver lining to the cloud. That's something that we would all prefer to see in a recession landscape, something that you know, recessions can be good in terms of what they deliver within businesses and efficiencies and, 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 and clear out within sectors. But you prefer them to be shorter and sharper than what we experienced in 09, which was drawn out for such a long period of time. And I think that having a dual market as a, as a potential it, it, with the liquidity there and corporate transactional activity is, it, it is a potential uh, uh, prediction. Yeah, well, on that note, that we'll maybe just close it off there then. Uh, Sal and Tanya, thank you so much for your time sure. today and um, and all the insights there. Really, really useful. And um, thank you all for tuning in as well. Um, as um, Sam mentioned earlier, we'll have all the details up on the website of the slides, etc., and the recording. So have a lovely afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm.